Have mercy on me, O God. <laughs> No, take it away. All of it. Tonight I honor Daniel in silence and with fasting. Now leave me. God, have mercy on me. In you, my soul takes refuge I'm in the midst of lions surrounded by ravenous beasts whose teeth are spears whose tongues are sharp as swords I call upon your name O Lord from the depths of the pit hear my plea Come near, you say, do not fear. Oh Lord, take up my case. Redeem my life. I am really excited about sharing this message with you today. This is part four of our Daniel Dilemma sermon series, and we've been going through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. And we've been looking at uh, how Daniel had to navigate the Babylonian culture. And it was a very evil culture. It was a, it was a sinful culture. It was a culture that did not respect the things of God or love the things of God. And Daniel had to learn how to navigate all that sin and still serve the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was his dilemma. That was Daniel's dilemma. How to live in this sinful world and not have it get to him or have it affect him. And that's our dilemma as well. We live in a Babylon-style society, um, and more and more so year by year. We live in a place where sin is running rampant and people are not wanting to serve the Lord. And how do we serve the Lord with all of our heart when there's so much peer pressure and so many negative things uh, around us. So that is Daniel's dilemma, and that's our dilemma as well. Now, at this point in Daniel's life, he is an older man, and what we're going to look at today, he's probably in his late 70s or 80s, and he's very well respected by the king's court and by the people that are around. Um, he is now a pretty much one of the top two or three people in the whole country, and the king, the new king, his name is Darius, the new king, he is uh, um, about to promote Daniel again. And so there's a lot of people then that are jealous of Daniel. They're jealous of uh, his promotion and his relationship with the king. So what they're about to do is set some traps for Daniel that Daniel could fall into. So let's look at Daniel chapter 6 together. We're going to start in verse 4. The other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling the government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So, verse 5, they concluded, the only chance, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. That's the only thing they could find. You know, they're not going to find something um, about his work life. They're going to have to find something about his spiritual life. So verse six, the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. Now watch what they do here. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced, give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone whether that be divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Well, verse 10, when Daniel learned that this law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual, as usual, remember that, in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he has always, had always done, uh, always done, 
giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and they found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then verse 13, the king, then they told the king, well, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Okay, well, Daniel's, he's not listening to that decree. In verse 14, hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. And he spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament, a predicament that he himself created. In verse 16, so at the least, at last, the king gave the orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. The king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting and he refused his usual entertainment and he couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and uh, ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. And the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children, which was common custom, sadly, back then for the Babylonians. We talked about how wicked they were. And the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den, proving that it was not that they weren't hungry. It's not the reason why those mouths of those lions were closed. Well, first, I'd like to start with the story of a man named Kelvin Cochran. Now, Kelvin Cochran dedicated over 30 years of his life to fighting fires and protecting the communities that he lived in. Now, he was born into extreme poverty in Shreveport, Louisiana, but at the age of five, he watched firemen fight a fire next door, and he knew from the very young age of five that he wanted to be a fighter, fi- firefighter. So he got his start at his hometown fire department, Shreveport, and he worked his way up the ranks. He became Shreveport's first African-American fire chief in 1999. Now, he served there until he was appointed the fire chief of Atlanta, Georgia, a very, very large fire department. And he um, was appointed that in 2008. Now, 2009, he had done such a great job in Atlanta, turning that department around, that um, his record drew the attention of President Obama. And he, he, in 2009, appointed Kelvin as the U.S. Fire Administrator for the United States Fire Administration. It's the highest ranking firefighter in the country. And it is an important um, uh, part of the uh, Obama um, administration. So now, uh, so he served there for a few years. But after uh, after a few years there, the city of Atlanta begged him to come back. So he returned back to Atlanta, back to his town where he was living at. Now, Kelvin was known for transforming the different fire departments that he led. And the cornerstone of his efforts was always in what he called participatory management structure. And what he would do is make sure that he got input from everyone, from every rank, race, shift, gender. He got input from everyone, including minorities and LGBT employees. And in his words, he said, I want to give every group a voice. So Kelvin was also, is also a committed Christian and actively involved in his church, Elizabeth Baptist Church. He's a deacon there, and he also leads a men's ministry, a men's Bible study. So now he was inspired by his faith. Uh, Chief Cochran wrote a book called Who Told You That You Were Naked? And it's a book that details the fall of Adam from the book of Genesis. And the takeaway of this short book, it's only 162 pages, is that only in Christ can men be rescued from their fallen condition and fulfill their purpose as husbands and fathers. 
So Chief Cochran's book briefly, very briefly, um, discusses the clear biblical teaching that sex is reserved for marriage and that biblical marriage is between a man and a woman. And so this biblical sexual morality is mentioned very briefly in this 162-page small short book. So one small paragraph and one small book then got the attention of some people who claim that Kelvin shouldn't be able to keep his job because of his religious beliefs. So the city of Atlanta initially suspended Chief Cochran for 30 days, but once that suspension was over, they fired him permanently. A thorough investigation revealed that he had not discriminated against anyone, but that, uh, but that didn't matter to him at the end of that suspension, he was fired. But you know what? In the end, God uh, shut the mouths of those lions for Chief Cochran. Because in October 2018, the city of Atlanta was forced to pay its former fire chief $1.2 million because they had wrongly fired him over his personal Christian beliefs. So what's the point of this story? See, Chief Cochran was thrown into the lion's den, but in the end, it all worked out for him, didn't it? He just kept on serving God throughout the whole situation. He trusted in God throughout the entire trial that he was going through, and God made everything turn out okay. God shut the mouths of those lions for Chief Cochran. Now, you see, we need to live clean to stay out of the traps laid out for us. Verse four says they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. They tried to find things on Daniel. They just couldn't find anything. They really looked, they couldn't find anything. Um, not that they weren't looking, it's that they couldn't find anything. So yes, the enemy is actually plotting against us. He really is. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that Satan is like a roaring lion looking in whom he may devour. He's searching. So that, that, that concept's important because what it means is Satan's looking for someone who is uh, an easy target for him. He's looking for, around for easy targets. Who's already compromising a lot? Who's already put themselves in situations that, that could be used so, I, so Satan could use them? So we need to be, you and I need to be hard targets for Satan. We need to make sure we don't have gray zones in our life that Satan can exploit and use as ammunition uh, against us, especially ammunition that we give him to fire back into our face. Now, in this very story, King Darius fell right into a trap himself. I mean, those guys came to him with this agenda. They didn't come because they thought it was a great idea to worship the king for 30 days. They came because they were jealous of Daniel and they wanted to take him out. So what did they do? They created this pride. They built on uh, King Darius's pride. Oh, your majesty, you're so great. You're so amazing. You're so uh, wonderful. We should just be praising you for 30 days. That's how great you And King Darius is like, yeah, I am pretty awesome. Yeah, I should be the one. So King Darius falls right into the same trap because of pride. These these sinful enemies of Daniel fell right into the trap of jealousy. But notice, nobody, Daniel's not falling into these traps. He, he, he's not going for that. Why? Because he was uh, living a life that didn't ha not have a bunch of gray zones in it because they couldn't find anything against him. Also remember, it did not work out too well for these fault-seeking, fault-finding people. They were, they were trying to find faults and it did not work out so well for them. And that's, that's a story all its own, right? So for you and me, we, we got to make sure that we're not, you know, scheming and fault finding and looking for problems in other people's lives and scrutinizing them. Cause every time we do that, all we've done is make it so it comes back on us. And that's what happened with these guys. Remember, they were thrown into the lion's den and, the, and Daniel was saved. So every time we go down that path of being a, a fault finder, well, guess what? It doesn't end up too good for us either. Now, I'd like to check out this video of a man who was led by God at just the right time. This is the testimony of Jeremiah Matlock. All right, my name's Jeremy. 
Um, I am a patient care technician at a hospital down here in Austin, Texas, and I love Jesus. <laughs> what happened was I got called to a cardiac arrest, started compressions as we do normally, pumped the guy full of epinephrine and all the drugs, We've shocked him multiple times, and his heart rhythm was just no signs of life in it at all. This guy was in VFib for probably 20, 25 minutes. This is pretty typical after about 25, 30 minutes, we start giving up because it's just, I mean, when I'm doing compressions on somebody, I'm literally breaking their ribs. They're already technically dead because they have no pulse, so we're shocking them multiple times. Once you've gone through 25, 30 minutes, it's just like, the thought is like, this guy's not coming back. I started praying under my breath because I just felt God was just like, you need to do something about this. And I started speaking life into him, commanding him to get up and started feeling the power of God just come down my arms. You know, it's like the scripture, Jesus said, I, I perceived that virtue came out of me. I'm like, oh wow, I know what this feels like now. And so I'm doing CPR on him and power of God's flowing and all of a sudden his heart rhythm comes back on the monitor. It's like, oh wow, this guy is alive now and God raised him from the dead, and this just happened, oh my God. He hates death. I, I just really feel that so strong. It's like, it is not his intention for people to pass into death like that. And I, I just had a, such a strong sense of the justice of God in that situation. Like he was so like, no, this is not okay. Uh, it's not his time to go. Um, you know, show my glory in this situation. I know here in the West, in America, they, it's not typical that you're gonna get to put your hands on a dead person, but get around as many sick, sick people as you can and pray for them, go after it, because that's what, I feel like that's what's missing in our, in our culture, is there's not a, a try in Christianity, but go after it and put that, let that be in your heart, let that resonate, like go after the miracles of God, go after seeing his glory manifested and seeing his heart. It's like, wow, God can use anybody. <laughs>
pray right now. I'm going to pray when I'm up. I'm going to pray when I'm down. I'm going to walk hand in hand with Jesus through every situation in my life. And when the trials come, I just keep on doing what I've already got the spiritual discipline in my life to do. So you and I both know we should be praying, right? So let's talk about how to pray. See, Daniel prayed with the heart open to whatever God would say. Verse 10, with the windows open. Now, the open window here represents uh, several things, but it really represents Daniel's heart. Daniel had an open window, and he was just praying out there. You know, I, I believe that represents Daniel's um, idea that he he's okay with whatever God would say to him. And many times I pray, maybe you pray, many times I've prayed where I, I wanted a preconceived answer from the Lord. I already had in my head what he was going to say or what he should say. And anything besides that would have been a disappointment or would have been frustrating to me. No, Daniel prayed with the windows open. He just said, God, I love you. I trust you. I'm with you. You're with me. We're for, you're for me. And he just prayed with that open heart about whatever God was going to say was okay with him. And notice he was on his knees in that open window. I mean, I think that's an important principle itself. He's on his knees. What's he doing? He's in that spirit of humility, saying, God, you're big and I'm little. God, you're so amazing and I need you so much. And I'm open to whatever you want to say to me, whatever you need to correct in me, whatever you need to adjust in me. That's what Daniel was praying. That was Daniel's position of prayer. There are many times I've prayed and God didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. He didn't answer the way I wanted him to answer it. But God is not saying these things to us because he wants to hurt us. He's not holding these things back from us for any reason except he's holding it back So, so, because it's not going to be helpful to us. And we got to trust him with open hearts that whatever he's saying is okay and whatever, and for our good, even if it hurts a little because it's so truthful, he's only saying those things because he loves us and he's trying to help us. Now, when we go to prayer, we need to have that same posture that Daniel had, a posture of humility, a posture of open-heartedness for God to say whatever God wanted to say to Daniel. See, Daniel prayed with a vision in his heart. Verse 10, with the windows open towards Jerusalem. And I want to focus on that towards Jerusalem. Why did Daniel pray facing Jerusalem? Now, I've studied out the different chronologies here of the book of Daniel. And so the book of Daniel is not necessarily in chronological order. So if you get past chapter 6, you start to get into some of the prophecies and some of the things that God had spoken to Daniel. And God had spoken to Daniel. Now, remember, he's from Judah. He was, remember week 1? He's a captive. He was taken up in this horrible situation. Well, God tells him, I'm going to take my people back from Babylon. I'm going to take them back to Israel where they belong. That's what God had told him. And it was such an important thing to him. So he would be in this spirit of open-heartedness and he would open up and he'd face Jerusalem because he was praying on a constant basis that my people are going to get up out of here and we're going to head to there. We're going to get up out of Babylon and we're headed back to our home, our real home, Jerusalem. Now God's going to drop a vision in our hearts. And when he does, when God puts a vision in our hearts, we got to pray that thing through. We got to pray that vision out. You know, maybe it's a vision for your family of how your, your kids, you want them to, how, what qualities you want in their life and what direction you, you want their life to go. Well, we're going to have to pray out that vision. I've got a vision for my family. I do. And I pray that vision out on a regular basis. I say, Lord, I need you to help my kids and help my wife and help me and as a family that we can get to where you want us to be. Because I got the vision in my mind and heart, but it's got to be prayed out. I've got a vision for our church. And I, I see what God, I see what I, in my mind's eye, in my heart, I see what God wants to do in our church. And I try to pray that vision out so that it, so that it takes place. So when God drops this vision in your heart, it's important that we pray it through. Later in the same book, the book of Daniel chapter 10, God gives this information, or is trying to get this information, this important prophecy, he's trying to get it into Daniel's heart. But it says that an evil spirit, actually a big principality demon named the Prince of Persia, was holding back 
this information from getting uh, to getting through this angel into Daniel's life. This this Satan was, you know, using this demon to interrupt the transmission. And so Satan's going to do that to us too, guys. We're going to get this vision. And when we get some information from God, some life changing information from God of what, what he wants us to be doing or, or how he wants us to go about doing something, well, we've got to pray because the devil's going to work hard to uh, disrupt this plan that God is trying to give us. So pray with the vision in our hearts, praying for our families, praying for our family and friends that don't know Jesus. Put a vision in your heart for the people that are around you, the people that you love, for them to come to Christ and then pray that vision out. Pray for our churches. Pray for the, the churches of the heartland. That, that the, the vision that God's got for these churches is, is going to take place and it's going to happen. Pray for uh, a vision in, in your own life, that the things and the gifts and the qualities and the skills that God wants to have placed in your life are placed in your life and that they're used for his glory. And lastly, believe that God is moving when we pray. Not a scratch was found on him. He trusted in God. When we pray, we need to pray by faith. Pray by faith. We need to live, we need to take this situation and take it up to the throne of heaven. You take this, so you, you got this thing in your heart, okay? You got this thing in your life and you're concerned about it, right? In this case, Daniel had, I'm gonna be thrown into the lions. I'm not very excited about that. So he took this case and he put it before the Lord and he believed that God was going to turn the situation around, which God does because Daniel prayed by faith. Faith was an important key principle here um, of, of, of Daniel being rescued from these lions. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, which many people call the, the hall of faith, it gives all these people that walk by faith and, and live by faith. And in that particular uh, chapter, verse 33, it says that by faith, Daniel shut the mouths of the lions. It was Daniel's faith that closed the mouth of those lions. So when we talk about praying by faith, what, what do we mean? What does is, what is praying by faith really look like? It means when we're going through something, we take that situation and we go to God with it. And we say, God, I need your help. I trust you. I, I, I believe you. I'm laying this before your feet. And then you, and then you, you walk off, you trust God to, to do what he needs to do in that situation. And, and listen, don't let anybody tell you, you can't pray more than once because what's going to happen is there's going to be some fear and some worry. It's going to come back over your life. <laughs> and when it comes back over your life, you know what you're going to need to do? You're going to need to go back up to God and say, God, here's the situation. I'm I, I need you to turn this thing around. I, I need to, I trust you, Lord, I believe. And we just keep praying by faith, believing that God is on the scene, that God's turning things around, that God's going to make a difference in that situation somehow. And each time we pray, we believe that God is working. Even if we can't see it, right? That's the lyrics of the song Waymaker. We believe that he's working. Now I've been praying <laughs> over the last several months for God to give me an opportunity to help people come to Christ and uh, for God to help uh, show me how to help some people find Christ or recommit their life to Christ. And God has been answering that prayer in my life in a way that I did not expect him to answer it. I was, uh, I was expecting him to give me opportunities to, to speak to people and have some God conversations with people. And he, he's done that in a way <laughs> that I really wasn't expecting. What he did was uh, started putting a lot of very hurting people in my life. People who have lost loved ones, people who have gone through difficult situations, uh, some of their own making, some of someone else's making, um, sick others that have sick, sick loved ones, uh, and all these hurting people, basically. And in the middle of all their hurt, <laughs> God has given me a chance to speak life to them, to encourage them, to give them some hope. And I just didn't see, at first, I was pretty discouraged by it. I'm like, there's just so much hurt in the world, Lord. And, and, and Lord, I don't know what to do about these things. And then God showed me, this is, the, this is an answer to your prayer, Heath. 
I'm, I'm open these doors for you so that you can speak life into situations and, and people can come and, and seek me in the middle of their pain. And once I realized that, uh, it was uh, life transforming, that God was actually answering a prayer that I've been praying and I just didn't see it as the answer at the time. Now we're about to do the application here, but let me tell you, this application is a little, little different than our usual ones. So let's go through this. There's two parts. First, Spend time praying every single day. That's pretty normal, but I mean it. And, and imagine if you had never heard that before. I know it's easy to go, oh yeah, spend time praying. No, let's do this. Let's spend time praying every single day. Let's be like Daniel with a life-giving relationship with Jesus that happens throughout the day as we walk hand in hand with God. And number two, use the Pray First app to help your prayer life. Now, what do I mean by the Pray Pray First app? It's a new app that's come out a couple months ago, and I have really been enjoying it. You can put down prayer requests inside of it, which I've done. It's got some prayer tools, uh, even some background music if you'd like some. It's just such a great assistance to our prayer lives. And I know as I've been using it, it's been able to uh, lengthen my times of prayer. It's been able to help me to be more focused in my times of prayer. So my, my encouragement would be, if you got a smartphone, download this app. Uh, it's, it's on Android and iPhone. And download this app, and it's called Pray First. And then really every morning, you know, just or at lunch, throughout the day, pay, take that thing open, spend a couple minutes in prayer, and let's build this prayer life that we've got with Jesus. Let's build it together. How about we, how about we right now, how about we pray about having a better prayer life? We pray right now, Lord that you help us to prioritize prioritize our relationship with you. Lord, there's so many distractions in the world today. So many things that, Lord, get in our way and, and we, we, we don't focus on the important things. And Lord, help us to be people of prayer. Put a spirit of prayer over our lives. Remind us that you're right there. Remind us to come and spend time with you. Lord, we're looking for you to help us. Lord, we don't even have the strength to, to pray without your help. But Lord, make it easy on us. Lord, we love spending time with you. We love taking those situations to you in prayer. And by faith, you turn them around and do what no man can do. And I pray that we just continue to bring things to you and see your mighty hand at work. We pray this in the name, above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen.